Good morning, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us this morning for our webinar. I'm Alex Hatting, Chief People Officer for Employment Hero, where our mission is to make employment easier and more valuable for everyone. I'm sure you've all read about the great resignation. It's been all over the media. The question is, will we see this at our own companies? To find out, we surveyed 1,000 employees in a number of countries. And so what did our insights report tell us? In Australia, 40% of employees surveyed plan to look for a new job in the next six months. And 15% of employees are currently already on the hunt for a new role. And would you believe 66% of younger workers aged between 18 and 24 are also already looking for a new job? What did our research tell us about why people were looking for a new job? The top three reasons were lack of career opportunities at 31%, no pay rise at 30%, and lack of appreciation and recognition at 26%. Last week, I spoke with Ben Thompson and Cassie Romy about how to retain your people. And today, we're going to do a deep dive into how to develop rising talent. I'm thrilled to introduce our first panellist, the wonderful Kelly Pfeffer, Senior Consultant, Early Careers at Scope Suite and Brightworks. Kelly has specialised in graduate recruitment and development for over 10 years, working across numerous industries from banking to insurance, technology, finance and engineering. Kelly was part of the Australian Association of Graduate Employers Committee before later becoming a director and then chair of the board. She created Grad Hero Hub to provide advice and coaching to peers in their early career stages. Kelly currently works as a consultant for both Brightworks and Scope Suite, helping to support their clients build and implement amazing early career programs. Secondly, I'd like to introduce Poncho Rivera Pavon, General Manager at NextStep. Over the years, Poncho has worked across different work environments and industries, from hospitality businesses to professional services. He's always had a strong focus on people. And for the past few years, Poncho has specialised in the graduate space. And it's here that he really found his place. With a background in psychology and human resources, Poncho finds working with people at the beginning of their professional journey fascinating. He is currently the general manager at Next Step, New Zealand's leading early talent careers platform. They have transformed the way organisations promote and communicate career opportunities to tertiary talent around New Zealand. Kelly and Poncho, welcome to today's panel. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great to have you both. So for learning and development, it's also sometimes referred to as training and development, human resource development, or career path. It encompasses a range of on the job and off the job methods for acquiring necessary knowledge, skills, and behaviors. So with this in mind, learning can be defined as the process of acquiring new behaviors, knowledge, skills, and attributes, which enhance employees' ability to meet current and future job requirements, and also perform at higher levels. So today we're going to talk about some ways that our small to medium businesses can think about how to help win the war for talent in 2022. So let's start by touching on pre-pandemic employee learning and development. Kelly, let's start with you. If you look back at what our world at work looked like pre-COVID, how important was learning and development to businesses? Sure. Thanks, Alex. Um, I th you know, I think, and thinking back to even the organisations that I worked for pre-pandemic, um, it was always really important. Um, it was always a priority. I think it was just probably thought about and delivered a little bit differently. Obviously, I mean, the most obvious is, you know, face to face, we used to actually get together. Um, but I think it was, you know, I think it was a little bit more planned. 
I think it was maybe more aligned to budgets that were available. Um, I think there was probably a little bit more, you know, being a bit more selective about which learning was being delivered or which learning we were allowing employees to go on. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think it was more aligned to a role per se, um, whereas I think, you know, now it's, it's more what skills do we need them to have or, or what interests do they have or, um, you know, what, you know, and, and it's sort of more bite-sized pieces of learning now too as opposed to big conferences or, you know, week-long workshops that you used to go to. So um, I think pre-pandemic, yes, it was important, but I think that, you know, the feel of it to me pre was more it was planned it was organized it was structured and it was sort of um you know holistically across the organization as opposed to individuals yeah yeah I would agree mm. with that and Poncho how do you think businesses are thinking about employee development differently since the pandemic well I think that I mean to Kelly's point, everything was a little bit more structured before, whereas now it's a lot more ad hoc, right? We don't know whether we're going to be able to host a training session or not. We don't know how things are going to go. And the way that I see employers using it is more towards retention and keeping their employees engaged. I mean, we were talking about the great resignation coming our way. And with that, I think we can learn a little bit from what other companies are doing. If you if you look at ICT companies across the world, they have like a smorgasbord of training programs for their staff to choose from. Um, and I think if we, if we use it like that, it's inevitable that once travel is back on the cards, I think we're, I'm speaking for everyone here, we are kind of a little bit afraid of a massive exit is happening. And if we use learning and development as a retention tool, we can probably keep them for a little bit longer. Um, yep. I think that's how we can use it just to retain the talent. Absolutely. And, you know, in, internally grow people so that hopefully they do have that career development, which was shown in the survey mm -hmm. as one of the reasons people are looking to, to leave. Moving mm -hmm. on to talk about junior talent and graduate programs. So there's a huge talent shortage at the moment, which so many of us businesses are, we're just at a loss as to how we can fill roles. Yet there's a lot of junior talent waiting to be shown the ropes. So Poncho, what are the best benefits for a business in hiring junior and graduate staff because let's face it for some managers it's just in the too hard basket because graduates do require a lot of a manager's time to train them. Mm -hmm. The first thing that comes to mind when I think about one of the main benefits is employee branding you know like I think the most important part is that the newer generations are a lot more vocal about their experience with an employer. And we know that that spreads like wildfire, right? So it's a generational thing. They like to talk about their experience. So the brand recognition side of things is really important. But at the same time, and like at the same time, I think that we are, when they come into our businesses, it's like a breath of fresh air. You know, like every time you welcome your interns or your graduates, like they're so excited and willing to learn that it like kind of like, recharges the amount of people that are around others so I think that's great but then apart from that you're creating a solid talent pipeline internally because if it's hard to hire with the with a great resignation happening I think we're going to see a lot more people at that experience level leaving so if you have like a good level at the bottom that can grow it's a little bit better I think and just sticking with that point show if you have managers that aren't willing to hire graduates, you know, they are giving that pushback and saying they're not bringing experience in, what advice would you have um, for someone in, say, my role, people and culture, to convince that manager to actually hire someone who is a graduate? I would say that, yes, you're investing a lot of your time to grow those people, but then they learn super fast and they're bringing like new ways of seeing things. And when we're at our level, we're sometimes a little bit out of touch with what the newer generations want and they bring what the, what the future and what people are seeing out there. So it just refreshes our view of the world and it impacts your ROI highly. Like the cost of having a graduate is a lot less than having an experienced hire. And sometimes they produce work a lot faster. Fantastic. Thank you. And moving over to you, Kelly, in your opinion, what do you think holds businesses back from hiring junior staff or even creating a graduate program? 
Yeah, and I think we've sort of touched on it already, but it, it usually comes down to resources and costs or, you know, or, or the perception of resources and costs, I would say as well, mm. because like I just said, the return on investment does come. Um, but I, I think what I found with employers is then they're often wanting a quicker return on investment than what a grad program can really deliver. So, you know, I've, I've spoken about this um, before where, you know, early talent and graduate programs really are a marathon, not a sprint. Um, but once you get those cycles happening, you'll get that return on investment every year. It's just when you're initially starting one of those programs, it might take two years before, you know, the grads that you're getting into the business are fully um, at 100%. But once you're bringing a new intake in every year, you've got that you've got that sort of consistent um, return happening. So I think it is really hard for them to see, get them to see longer term the benefits of an early careers program. A lot of them, particularly when they've got existing vacancies in their business, they just want to fill those roles, fill those roles. Um, because and they just want it with as light touch as possible with the perfect person that we know doesn't exist um, and so it's really hard to manage those expectations because when they're under pressure and they've got a lot of work to do and they just need you know people in in roles to help them get that work done it is really hard to get them to sort of you know lift their head above the clouds for a little bit and just say hey yes, short term, we can help you. But at the same time, we really need to put a long term strategy in play here, because otherwise, you're going to keep having the same problem over and over and over again. So let's also put a longer term strategy in, so that we can help alleviate, you know, like, prevention is better than cure, right? So let's try and put some things in place that actually help set you up for the future as well. Amazing. And I'll stick with you, Kelly, and then move to mm -hmm. Poncho on the next question. What advice do you have for businesses who want to consider graduate programs, especially for many of the small to medium businesses that might be on this webinar that are already under-resourced? Look, I think, you know, one of the things that happens in the early career space is, you know, I think a lot of people just assume that, you um, you know, you've got to have this whiz-bang program to be successful and, you know, and the way one organisation does it is the way we have to do it and if you don't do it that way, it's not going to be successful. I think, you know, everyone can create their own bespoke program that meets their needs but it, it can be scalable it, it can be scalable depending on what you can what resources you can put to it um and scalable to the outcomes that you're going to get out of it as well so you can do something that's very simple even if you start with one university that you partner with they can get you a few grads and you start from there um you know it can be as simple as that it doesn't need to be a big whiz bang um thing that other organizations do and you know to be honest the other organizations who are really high profile doing some really great things it's because they've been doing it for a long time so they they started somewhere too so um yeah i think it's just having courage to get started really amazing yeah. and and poncho any advice from you i think it's a matter of like planning where you want your junior talent to get to. And I agree 100% with Kelly. You don't need to start big. I think sometimes doing people doing like winter internships, you know, they're only there for a couple of weeks. It gives you a little bit of a taste of what it's like to bring junior talent into your business. And then you can later on replicate it and create like a summer internship. It's only 12 weeks of your time and you'll see the return of investment. It's showing you what you can do, what you cannot do. And then you take that and you scale it up to a graduate program. I fully agree with going to one university. Maybe it can, you can even start with one single area in your business, right? So you can you can get like, I think the easier way would be to get like an intern for HR because normally the people that are running these programs are people in HR. So we have a lot of control of what's happening and, you know, trial and error, you know? I think that's the best advice that I can give. Start small, just, you know, get someone in HR, it's easy. Yeah, love it. Start small. And I think one of the uh, on effects of that is you have someone come in and do an internship, give them a great experience. They go back to that university and they talk to all of the other students or they talk to their friends about it. And so you're upping your EVP in terms of your company um, 
employer brand proposition as well, which is uh, another gained advantage. So I'd love to move on to talk about career mapping. So whether it's existing employee, employees, junior or more senior, career development was a really important reason why people were considering leaving their roles in our employee movement and retention reports. Kelly, career progression is important and yet it's so common for businesses to lose great talent because they don't actively think about it. Could you provide an overview of what career mapping is or career development strategies? Yep. Um, so why, I mean, things I've used in the past, uh, you know, sometimes you'll have resources around career pathways. So as an organisation, you've identified what some pathways may look like for certain, um, you know, um, streams within your organisation, for example. So what are those stepping stones that, that could be recommended for someone? Um, I've also done talent assessments where you're, you know, looking at individuals and, and trying to identify who your high potentials are um, or who are people who may need some additional support um, with their career. Um, there's, there's lots of different ways that you can do it. And I think it also depends on the size of your organization as well. Um, obviously, you know, my experience in larger organizations, um, there's usually the tools and the strategies there, but it's actually up to the manager to help implement those. Whereas, you know, smaller organisations, the whole thing might sit with HR because you've got an intimate knowledge of every person that works in the organisation. So um, it can be slightly different. I think for me, what's changed to a few years ago to now is this, is this notion around, I think, you know, years ago we were employed to do a role and there was a defined role that you were employed to do. Whereas I think, you know, work is now, it's now evolving more to what work do we need someone to do as opposed to a role per se. So I think that's gonna be the challenge for career mapping moving forward, particularly with individuals is what type of work am I actually interested in doing? Not what role am I interested in moving into next? So um, I think that will be, and particularly for early career talent, um, that's that'll be huge in relation to that period of rolling off a grad program and into a full-time role or job or whatever you want to call it is what work are they actually interested in doing? Um, what sort of exposure are they looking to get out of that work? Um, do they want to lead people? Do they not want to lead people? Do they want to specialise? So I think there's lots of, it's going to get more complicated in a way because we need to look at people as individuals um, and individually what they're aspiring to. Whereas I think that the tools and the processes in the past have been very much at a high level, broad, generic um, type approach. Great. And what role does a manager have to play in this compared to either the business overall or HR? Personally, I think the manager is, is the day-to-day -day, um, person who needs to be having those conversations with their, with their team members. Um, I think the manager has that intimate knowledge of the, of the person and the work that they're performing and, you know, where they want to get to and the type of work they enjoy um, and the type of work that they want to do more of. Um, I think HR, the business obviously can help provide structure, frameworks, tools, systems, all of that sort of stuff. I think HR then plays a role in helping to coach and develop managers into taking on on that role on employees as opposed to HR really being responsible for it. But that's, you know, that's my view on it. Yeah, no, and I, and I agree. And one of the um, tools that we use at Employment Hero in our one-on-one -on -one templates, we actually have that question. So we are making sure managers are having that ongoing conversation around career development. Where do you want to go? What do you want to develop? And I also think um, especially young people miss that link of on the job learning. They don't necessarily, they, they think going to a course is all about you know, that's how they're going to be trained and developed. Whereas if you can make that link as a manager to kind of say, well, you know, what have you learned by doing this project and what skills have you gained? You're helping to highlight that their career is being um, bolstered by on the job learning. Mm -hmm. uh, over to you, Poncho. For those businesses who have junior staff or graduate programs in place, how can they truly identify standout employees with high potential? Mm -hmm. This is this is a little bit of a tricky question because we're talking about potential here and potential it's a little bit hard to quantify right 
I think that when we're dealing with these people um, at the early stage of their career, I'll just touch a little bit on, on the career roadmap because I think it's important um, to be able to show them where they're going. The newer generations are not just looking at having all this um, training and going to a job for the sake of having a job for them. It's becoming a matter of how is this job going to make me better in my career, right? Mm -hmm. So it's super important to have that very clear from an employer's perspective because I think giving them this on the job training will be really good. And having, I think we need to look at managers like talent coaches internally. We need to have those conversations because I'm a very visual person, right? So for me to understand how talent operates in terms of potential, I normally like to diagram things and create charts. So what has worked for me in the past is I normally create two axes. One that talks about technical skill and the other one talks about opportunity and ability to learn. So if you put them in that little chart, it will tell you where the employee is and whether you need to coach them a little bit more, whether you need more like formal training, whether they need to be more um, like working a team. And by having this diagram will allow you to literally visually see where your staff are at. Because otherwise it's a little bit complicated, but we need the manager to be having those conversations. Those are the people that know how technical someone is versus their uh, ability to learn or how willing they are to learn. Because let's remember that sometimes with graduates, they're coming from being at the top of their career student-wise. And then going to the bottom is a little bit hard. You know, they have all this knowledge that sometimes it's a little bit hard for them to link it to the real world. So having that conversation, that clear diagram will probably help them heaps. Oh, amazing. Um, and besides these more formalized programs, career mapping and graduate programs, how can businesses introduce learning and development into every day in kind of a more casual way? We normally, what, what I have done in my previous jobs is we normally have like whip meetings every Monday, right? And when we have these conversations, I normally talk about a certain project that we have going on and I ask people to do a little bit of research about it. And they're like, okay, so today it's your turn to lean to talk about, I don't know, if we're gonna do like agile methodology. So it's Susan's turn to talk to us about it. So we talk in those like meetings about what it is in like small, like bite-sized learning pieces, you know? It's a lot easier for them to identify that they're learning and then you ask them questions at the end and it just happens very informally. Great, that's fantastic advice, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's explore how technology can either help or hurt us and what the future of employee development looks like when it comes to technology. So Poncho, sticking with you, how mm -hmm. do you think technology can help or hinder employee training and development? Well, I think we've seen that technology really helped us over the last couple of years, right? So we were able to move everything online. And with that comes a lot of trust as well, particularly with like younger employees, where the old school way of thinking about things is if they're not sitting at the desk, they're not working. Whereas now trust is growing a little bit more. So technology has helped us to do that. But at the same time, we know that Zoom fatigue is real, right? So even though we're dealing with na with technology natives where they like can do things on their phone way faster than I can do it on a computer, they do get tired of that. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the pendulum is starting to swing the other way where people are finding it hard to learn how to connect. And because human beings were social by nature, right? Having our interactions being restricted and controlled, how can you connect with someone? When can you do it? Um, it's actually creating a little bit of anxiety. So at the same time, I think that yes, technology will probably help us deliver all these training programs online, but we also need to encourage our people to link with each other because we live in a world where relationships are what, what's happening all the time. I think as we get out of this massive pandemic, we need to start encouraging people to connect with each other. Yes, I agree with that. Social connection is huge. And I was reading a really interesting take on Zoom fatigue uh, in an article and they brought up a really great point. And that is if you're sitting in a meeting with someone or you're having a one-on-one, -on -one, you're not actually looking at just their face so close up. And that's why we are feeling a lot of Zoom, not just fatigue, but sometimes um, just a, a little bit of overwhelm because you usually don't get that intimate with someone unless it might be your own partner in life. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why people are feeling so Zoom fatigued. Kelly, moving over to you, what is the future of employee training and development technology? What have we got to look forward to? It's in, yeah, it's interesting and I'll, 
if I can add a really quick point to the previous question as well, I think where technology has also helped us as well, particularly in early careers, is, is also the, the collection of information about our people at the recruitment stage, um, because the technology is allowing us to actually know our candidates even, even better than we ever did in the past, and then using that information to help inform the learning that we, we offer our early career talent as well. And I think that's probably something in the early career space that we've done quite well compared to the rest of the hires in a business. Um, usually it's because the other hires in the business are usually hired for specific skills, whereas the early career talent does, don't necessarily have those skills coming with them yet. So um, I think that's where technology has definitely helped. In relation to the future, um, I think I, I personally think we're probably going to try to go back to a mix of both technology and in person um, so technology where it makes sense to particularly in early careers programs where your talent is dispersed geographically um, you can you can make the most of, of technology but you know things like like virtual reality would be amazing particularly like you know if you need to do some safety training like you know for these grads who are out on mine sites and things like that um, if you're able to do you you know some safety training in a virtual reality environment like that would be a pretty fun and cool thing to do I think um, I would love to see you know particularly compliance training is so usually so boring and um, drab but we we know we all have to do it so you know gamifying some of those things a little bit more just to make it a little bit more interactive and um, interesting I think would be a really cool thing to do um, but yeah and I think just also the technology allows us also to start creating a portfolio for ourselves as well. So as we are completing learning and capturing feedback and all of those sorts of things, how cool is it to, you know, in a year's time to have a, a portfolio of our learning journey for the last 12 months and, and technology has captured that for us. We haven't had to remember it all and we haven't had to sort of, you know, keep track of it all. And, you know, and we can take that information with us into performance discussions or development discussions and it's all there ready packaged up for us to go. So I think, you know, there's lots of opportunities with technology, but I think, you um, for me, I think we also just need to acknowledge that everyone has different learning styles as well. And I think that's mm. where technology is challenging in that we don't always allow for different learning styles. Um, yeah, that's a really important point. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on to a really hot topic, which is remote work or hybrid work. So, you know, we have heard that all employees want to maintain this remote work. However, for a grad or someone new on the job, that's going to be a challenge for them because, you know, pre-pandemic, you were in the office and you could overhear conversations with salespeople, um, sit in a meeting room, even sit next to your mentor or your boss. So what's the advice for um, those on the webinar around how to tackle this in a remote world of work? Have you got an example, Poncho? Uh, yeah, I think it's interesting. So I was talking to I was talking to one of my colleagues that works at a law firm recently. And when we're talking about law, for example, having a, a, a grad sitting next to a senior lawyer is very useful. Because mm. if you don't if you don't understand something, you literally just turn around and ask. Whereas doing it remotely, you have to book in a time, you have to make sure that it's happening. And sometimes just doing it through Slack or Teams or something, it's just not the same. Yeah. So I do think I do think that it's important for us to consider, yes, let's be a little bit flexible because we have proven that people can be quite productive working on their own. And you know, who doesn't want to be able to have you know, pancakes on Wednesday for breakfast, if you want to, you know, um, but at the same time, I think we do need to keep encouraging people to learn by being in the same room. We pick up so much just from hearing others. Mm. So yeah. I think a mix between the two of them, like, yeah, flexibility is encouraged. Um, but then also, I think also at this time, people have been working on their own for so long that working with others would be a very welcome change. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. Um, 
I know it's been really difficult for the ones who have had to start remotely um, and, you know, and, and, you know, and just looking at some of the feedback from programs where they have had to start, you know, obviously it, it's not the ideal situation and it's not, a, it's not a situation that they envisioned they would be in, you know, when they're at uni, but I think the organisations that have done it well have really put a lot of planning into it really thought about it from the graduates perspective around how it would feel um, for them to be experiencing that and I and I think they've re had to resource it well so the grad program manager has actually taken on a lot more of that interaction than probably what they would have in the past like making sure that they're touching base with them regularly um, organizing you know social elements virtually for them to help them connect as a cohort um, but also a lot of training of managers in how to support new talent on like virtually as well it does require the manager to be a lot more engaged than what they would be if they were in the office because you know out of sight out of mind and so you know, like simple things like making sure that the manager actually has a five minute check in with them every day, which they wouldn't do if they were in the office. So because that would just happen organically. So it's 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 a lot of things. But I think starting with, you know, that that putting yourself in their shoes, what would it feel like? What would I need from the organization? Um, that that's what the organizations that have done it well have done, I think. Yeah. 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 And certainly here at Employment Hero, we've onboarded hundreds of people um, during the past 18 months or two years. And we've found shadowing works really, really well. So, um, you know, having a new salesperson jump on a sales call and just explaining yeah. to the client, Alex is on the call today because she's going to learn. Same thing for my team, shadowing with interviews so um, so that they can hear what your pitch is about the company and, yeah. and how you're talking about the company and how you're interviewing and what kind of questions you're asking just so that they can learn all of that. And I think structuring their work a little bit differently as well. So making sure that they've got a combination of things that, yes, they may need to research or get some support with, but making sure that every day there's a chunk of work that they can just get on with by themselves as well so that they're feeling productive and they're feeling like they're contributing, but at the same time doing some work that requires them to get some learning and development as well. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you, oh, oh, I'll let you go first, Poncho. Because I was thinking, imagine being new at a company and you're spending all this time looking at a screen, talking to people. It feels a little bit artificial. So mm -hmm. it's what I would do is I would space the quick wins so that they can work on those on their own, you know? Yeah. So yeah, having like maybe having a chat with them in the morning, then giving them a little bit of time so they can just do their own thing, read whatever they need to read. Um, we need to restructure how we are, how we're thinking of performance as well, because mm -hmm. Performing doesn't necessarily need to be them being online, looking at the screen where you can see them working all the time because that puts a lot of pressure as well. Oh, absolutely. And um, I think reward and recognition also comes into that. And that is making sure you reinforce the behaviours. So if you have someone on your team that's gone above and beyond to learn a new skill or, or go and find an online course to, to be recognising them across the entire company through your reward and recognition program um, to, to really make that happen. I'd love to hear from both of you. Um, you know, there's this whole concept around psychological safety. For someone who's been onboarded virtually and remotely, how do you give them that psychological safety to be able to say to their manager look I know I've got this project but I, I'm stuck I, I don't know what my next steps are I think that one of the things that we can do to do that is modeling the behavior that you want to see mm. so I think we can all agree that it has not been easy for any of us right and very often um, I was having a conversation with one of my staff members a few weeks ago and we were in a meeting and I, I opened up to one of my clients. I was like, yeah, well, I've been feeling a little bit under the weather for the last couple of days. Um, and then I kind of forgot that I had like one of my team there. And when we finished and I caught up with her, I said, oh, I'm sorry that you had to hear that I was not doing that well. And she said, actually, that was amazing because I've been feeling like that too. But I didn't want to tell you because I thought that you were going to feel that I was not performing or that I was just not good enough. Mm -hmm. So I think modeling the behavior is super important so they can feel that if you can do it, so can they. Yeah, being vulnerable is so, so important as a manager. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
a, a really quick, easy thing as well is just giving like your early talent and their managers um, checklists or scripts for their their daily catch ups as well. So um, just to help know that you know on the list is to talk about how would you like me to contact you or how often are we going to meet or just little things like that so that it's, you know, it's all out in the open and everyone, you know, they are agreeing on how they, they work together and that, you know, and then that gives the grad a little bit more um, confidence, I suppose, around, well, you know, they just, they know how it's going to work. They know what questions they can ask and um, then they can just move forward really because a lot of the time, particularly in onboarding, then most of the questions that you'll get is, uh, you know, what do I do if I have a question or is it okay to ask a question? Or um, So I think just getting all that out in the open up front just allows them to move on, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've found sometimes assigning a buddy so that if the manager's yeah. not available, they do have someone that they can go to and kind of say, I don't know how to do this or I don't know how to do that. Yeah. Great. So let's move over to questions from our um, attendees. So first of all, Bernadette has asked whether we can send out out the survey results and we absolutely can um, really 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 great results and um, really interesting to, to look at the different countries and that younger group in particular that are already looking for jobs and the next question experience says that an employer that as an employer you spend great deal of time and money to train the new interns interns use it to their advantage and to enrich their resume with this training, they leave the organisation, so there is no guarantee that they will stay with you, which is something we hear a lot from managers. Kelly or um, Poncho, do you want to take that? I think one of the things that I've done in the past is when we provide training to some of our staff, um, particularly at that beginning um, stage of their careers, if it's like a big chunk of money that you're attaching to them, we just bond to them. That's normally how we do it. It's like, we will give you, we will give you this training. We will support you through your CA or your, um, to, to like your professionals for law. Um, but in chain, in exchange, you're going to work with us for at least two years, right? So that's normally how we've done it in the past to mitigate those things, because that does happen. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I think it all depends as well on your, your reason for having interns in the first place as well. Um, so if, if your strategy for interns is retention, then you would be setting up your strategy and structuring your program very differently to if your intent is to raise awareness of your organisation, help skill some new people in a particular area that you know there's a skills shortage in, um, you know, and, and your intent is to contribute to the ecosystem of learning of early career talent, then retention is not one of your success measures. So I think it I think it does go back to why are you getting interns in the first place, and that's how you structure your program. And if retention is important, then you 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 would put mitigating um, things in place to help make sure that retention stays high. So, um, but you know, with interns, you you're never going to get 100% retention anyway because that's the whole intent behind internships. Yeah, oh, mm -hmm. every employer, you're never going to get 100% retention. And on that, I'd note um, for managers the importance of having those career conversations so that the interns or whoever you might be training knows what their next career step is and mm -hmm. you're taking an interest in it. Also, making sure you compensate people if they're promoted for the external market value of a job. Quite often, companies will limit themselves for promotions to, say, a 10% increase. And, of course, you're going to see an employee leave to go external if they're going to be getting a 30 or 40 um, K increase in their salary. Um, and another really interesting piece, um, LinkedIn did research and their average tenure is two years. So during induction, they are super upfront. They say our average tenure is two years. If you need to leave, chat to your manager about it. We will encourage you. But during those two years, we will give you everything. And in return, we expect you to give everything of yourself to the company. And, mm -hmm. you know, in doing that, maybe they'll go and get a job, learn new skills somewhere else and come back to you, um, yeah. which is always yeah. a, a great. And look, um, there's plenty of interns who do internships with other organisations who don't stay with them and they come to you. So yeah. it all works out in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. exactly. Right it's providing a positive um, uh, like environment and experience for them. 
at the end of the day, internships are so that people can try before they buy, right? So if yeah. they come in and they don't like the kind of work, well, the last thing that you want is someone that's disengaged in your workforce. Yeah. And hopefully Absolutely. you're set, and hopefully you're setting it up in a way that the 10, 12 weeks that they're with you, they're actually contributing something to mm-hmm. you as well. They're not just mm-hmm. getting training, they're actually contributing as well. Yeah. Fantastic. And a question from Tony. We are a small startup company in Australia and we are wanting to hire a few graduates and develop a graduate development program. This is a new area for me. So do you have some tips on how Tony would get started? I think, Kelly, you have a great tool for this that I've seen on Grad Career Hub. Grad Career Hub. Yeah, so there, there are... There are easy ways. I think there are, there's a lot of variables, obviously. It depends on which disciplines that you're needing to hire. I'm making an assumption it might be tech. I don't know. Um, but it, it can vary by the disciplines that you're looking to get in. But I would just start with, like at a very, very simple level, start with your local university, um, have a conversation Um, A lot of universities have internal teams that will help source applicants for you. So you don't even need to do that part of it. Um, But yeah, grad, I mean, thanks, Panche. Like Grad Hero Hub is is a place where we can um, like provide you with just advice and guidance around um, tips and tricks around how to get started. Um, that's no problem. Um, things also like the Australian Association of Graduate Employers is also a good place for information. Um, but usually I find most people just reach out to someone who's already doing um, a grad program and just ask them, how did you do it? How'd you go about it? So, yeah. If they, I'm sorry, there's no simple answer to it because I think it, it can be um, can be easy or as, as difficult as you want to make it, I suppose. <laughs> I think I think that the key thing there is to get started, yeah. learn along the way and, and ask for feedback. That's also really important. So um, if you do an internship and you have someone leave, try and do some kind of exit survey with them so that you're always getting ideas on how to improve. Yeah. And mm. Poncho, a question for you. Could you please mm. re-go over your access technical skills and um, where you were plotting your person for potential? Mm-hmm. Right, so it's uh, technical skills and I do attitude towards learning. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Is Alex able to share the article on Zoom fatigue and if there were any combat to that? Yes, I will try and find um, where that's at. And I, you know, I just found it really interesting because I'd never thought of that. You don't, you're not that close in someone's face when you're in a meeting. Um, Next question, hybrid work with new grads or young talent. Any thoughts on setting up virtual office space, e.g. create a room where a few people could log on or perhaps their manager and the new grad so that they are working at the same time and having this virtual room open in the background so that asking questions isn't as formal. Is this a good idea or any thoughts on the best platform to do that? I think it's a great idea. Um, in my team, we started doing something. It's a platform called Gather. And it looks like a mini video game. Um, and the way that you set it up is that every time that your little uh, like your little character walks to up towards someone, you can actually listen to them and see them. So you don't actually need to book anything. You're like in close proximity to a person or you create like a table and everyone in that little table can talk with each other. Um, we started using it a couple of months ago and it has worked really well for us. Also because there's like a gamified situation around it that just makes it a little bit like a breath of fresh air. Mm. I think it's important also to to make sure that you set the scene for why you you're doing it that way as well. Um, Because I think I think there is a difference between a group of experienced people using a platform like that, because they've got more confidence in what they're doing and and more confidence that they're being trusted to do what they're doing. Whereas you know, set, setting up a platform like that, particularly with a grad and a manager, you want to be really careful that you're not giving the impression that it's to monitor yes. what's going on um, and that you don't trust them to get on and do their work. So I think as long as it's done in the right intent and communicated in the right way around why you're doing it and how to use it and how to get the most out of it, I, I think it, it, it can be quite fine. And remembering too, I think it's one of those things where, 
making sure that people are comfortable working that way as well. Don't make an assumption that everyone wants to work that way either. So, you know, your introverted people might not want to sit on a virtual platform with their manager for a few hours. Um, that could be completely exhausting for them. So, yeah. Yeah, and you make such a good point, Kelly. It's been interesting. You know, our extroverted kind of salespeople have really wanted our office Mm -hmm. to reopen so they can go in and socialise and hear each other on the phones, go to our product team. I don't think they've been into the office for 18 months to two years because they are just loving working from home. Mm -hmm. And Carl asks a really interesting question. Over the past two years and with COVID and the change in work arrangements, Carl is seeing a shift in people not wanting to advance so that they can manage this better work-life balance. Oh, I'm an example of that. (laughs) (laughs) So I... um, I my full time role was ended 18 months ago with COVID and um, it was a time for me where I really reassessed what I wanted to do moving forward. Um, and I decided I didn't want to lead people anymore. Um, just at a point in my life where that doesn't give me energy anymore. Um, and so I've gone moved to I've got two casual roles that I do consulting work for and I manage my own time completely 100% from home um, and loving the change to be honest so I I just I think I worked out that I just didn't want to be 100% committed to any one job or one employer anymore and I just wanted to be paid for the work I wanted to do using the skills and experience that I have so And I think a lot of people I talk to are very, very similar. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. I um, would also make sure when you're having those career discussions, um, one thing that we found um, around career progression is if someone leaves, try and look internally um, for the talent to move into that role first, even if they're not 100% ready, mm-hmm. they'll get there if they've got the right attitude. And, and back to um, Poncho's point around, you know, his two accesses of um, their affinity to want to learn and give them that assurance that just because they're being promoted, you're going to backfill their role. So they're not necessarily going to be working 24 seven or or go through the expectations and just be really transparent about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Definitely look internally. Yeah, 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 100%. Uh, The next question, I think you'll both have great answers for uh, recommendations for specific coaching tools or techniques. All right. Well, I've I've read a couple of these, but the first, there's just one book that comes to my mind is something called the Five Minute Coach, mm. um, and it's super fast. It provides with like a very easy way um, to get into the, the like what coaching is. Um, the theory behind it is that you uh, you have every conversation the same way every time, so you get really good at having that conversation. But I don't think it's like a long-term tool for you. You can read it just so you can start thinking about how it works and what kind of questions you're going to be asking. Uh, But then after that, I think the main thing that you can do when you're coaching is literally be be curious about who the person in front of you is Um, and make sure that everything that you're doing just is asking questions as many as you can. Um, But yeah, that book will probably give you like the overall guidelines on how to do it. And any from you, Kelly? Oh, I don't have any specific tools or techniques, but I think like what Pancha said, it's it's important that you're asking the questions, not doing the talking. <laughs> that's yeah. that's my biggest tip is make sure that, yeah, because I think if some people feel like they want to just give advice, but that's not actually coaching. It's actually about helping the person discover the answer themselves. Yeah, and you're spot on, Kelly. Coaching is all about having the person come up with the answer for themselves and coaching them through that. Uh, I learned a great model when I worked at Google, which was called the GROW model. Mm -hmm. And they're basically open-ended questions um, that you ask the employee, which helps to take them on that journey where where they're going to come up with a solution. And even more than that, by them coming up with the solution, they're owning it and they feel some accountability. So if anyone wants the GROW model, just look up a website called RE, R-E, Work, and it will actually have the GROW model on there um, for you as well as a deck to take you through how to coach someone. Mm -hmm. The next Mm -hmm. question, how can we meet the desire for 
career progression when there aren't many open jobs for promotions. Um, you can look at people taking on additional responsibility and ask them what that additional responsibility is that they want so that they can be ready to be promoted into a job. But reality is quite often you won't have the job and you may see them leave the company. I'm not sure, Kelly and Poncho, if you have anything on that. No, I agree with you. I think it's exactly that. Yeah. Great. Uh, next question. What changes have you seen in the starting salary rates for early career employees or graduates? Yeah, this is uh, this is a really good question. Um, we like here in New Zealand, we conduct like the, like, the largest um, graduate survey. And what we saw over the last couple of years is that salary expectations reduced a lot of it. Um, whereas in the past, and I'm talking about like New Zealand numbers, but like, whereas before it was more towards the 60K and over, um, over the last year it went down to like 50 to 55. So 5K less um, and people are just, I mean, students are a little bit anxious about work opportunities. We know that um, graduate roles have decreased at certain points throughout the year. So they're just very willing to negotiate. As long as you can give them training and development, they'll be happy. Mm. I think um, salary used to be a big, uh, important factor in Australia a few years ago, but um, it, like Poncho said, it's not it's not the deciding factor anymore. Um, in Australia, we mostly just see a cost of living increase to salaries, um, as opposed to any significant jump from a demand perspective. But um, their, their their main focus when they're looking for roles and working out which ones to accept is more about the experience that they're going to be given. Um, what what they're going to learn from the experience and what the future looks like for them in that organization as opposed to any sort of starting salary yeah yeah I'd agree with you both and also um, one of the things our research has shown a lot is that uh, younger people are looking to work for a company that has a meaningful purpose or mission so not just a company that is out there selling widgets so so make sure you have a really strong mission and purpose and also really strong values um, because they want to align their own personal values with yours. Poncho, we've got two questions around the system that you were using. Was it Gather? Mm -hmm. And are there any security concerns around it? Yes, it's Gather. And so far, because we're using it internally, we haven't identified any security concerns. I don't know whether larger employers have been using it, but I can check that. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, the next question, in relation to the previous question about interns using things for their resume, do you find there's a separation growing with managers and execs that seem to be forgetting they came from the same place and every single person uses training to benefit their resume? Is it how we afford to have a roof over our heads reflected by the great resignation? I'm finding younger people are no longer accepting below average environments that encourage the poor culture of overworking for no return. Mm -hmm. mm. I would agree hundred percent. I think mm -hmm. um, the newer generations and to your point, Alex, they're looking a lot about, they're looking at corporate social responsibility and things like that. And any behavior that's below the line is no longer acceptable. Especially, especially when we saw the Me Too movement coming so strongly a couple of years ago um, and the universities making a really clear point to students that there is behavior that is not acceptable, um, it happens very often. Like I've, I've heard about people who, who left employers because they were not okay with the culture. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, look at the um, the reputational damage that Uber had when um, all of that came out and they, they lost employees yeah. due to that. Next yeah. question is, how do you keep L&D frameworks relevant to all employees when there may be a big focus on the technical teams and not so much relevance to the support staff, for example, accountants or receptionists? We want everyone to feel just as important. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. I would, with what we, we were talking at the beginning that we need to have a focus on individual learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that a way to structure this differently is to create a competency framework. So people don't necessarily need to have like a very defined path. Maybe Monday is a matter of learning negotiation. And then next week, it's a matter of learning um, AML. 
you know, if you create like, like this competency framework, it will be very easy for them to choose, pick and choose what they want to learn from. And everyone can choose those um, topics and learn however they see fit. Mm. Right. I think it's a conscious decision by the organization as well to be mindful of every individual within their organization mm. as well. Mm. It, it's, it's a bit of a behavioral mindset shift as well, I think. And, and that's got to be done by everybody. It's, it's not just a framework that's going to help you do that. Yeah, and also back to the importance of having the manager ask about career development goals uh, in their weekly one-on-ones. That's super important. And yeah. so is inclusion. So if you're having a course on negotiation skills, open it up to everyone in the organisation. Um, mm-hmm. You might not think it's relevant to a receptionist, um, going back to that example, but that particular receptionist might want to learn about negotiation skills. So I'm being sure really they would have to do it every day. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and Kylie Silva, thank you so much um, for highlighting. So it's the five minute coach by Lynn Cooper and Mariette Costellino. I think I've screwed up that last name, but yeah. Mm. Uh, the next uh, question, and it looks like the last one Have any of you used additional video virtual tools, ED, Voodle, or similar, to assist maintaining culture and connection in the transition to hybrid and virtual workplace? We have not used any of these. However, when attending younger talent are considering them and would love your thoughts. Mm, I haven't used it, to be honest. We've started using one called Loom, where you can have presentations in the background and you appear kind of small um, and they can be bite-sized videos allowing for asynchronous communication. So when you're working across time zones, uh, you're doing remote work, you might have someone dropping, doing a school pickup or drop off, they can go back and watch that video at any point in time. Yeah. Mm. Good. That sounds interesting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a tool I'd recommend. Mm Well, that brings us to a close. Thank you so much, Kelly and Poncho. It's been so great having you on and your expertise and all of your advice has been incredible. Thanks to everyone who's joined us today and we hope to see you next week in our next uh, series for War of Talent. Thanks so much and have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone.